Good morning. Man, it's good to be here. It's good to be here. All right, so, but down for being here to just check a box, right? Like, we don't want to be one of these places where people come and just go, well, I just come on Sundays because that's what I do. It's culturally accepted and, you know, it's just like down with that. We don't want that here, right? Like, when Megan prayed, you know, about our lives being transformed, like, that's the reason we come here on Sunday mornings. It's not just to come to see everyone, although that's great. Uh, it's not just to come to, to be able to, you know, pat yourself on the back and say, well, I went to church Sunday. We come here to surrender, which is what we just sang about, to surrender in order to be transformed so that Christ can be magnified in me, right? Less of me, more of him. That's the equation. Less of me, more of Christ. Christ being magnified as I surrender when I come here and worship and praise and open God's word and then let the, the, the word just wash over me and change me from the inside out. Cool? We cool with that? Okay, so that's why we're here. So um, again, remember, we're treating these next several Sundays like family Sundays. There's kids in here today. Um, you know, kids, man, listen, if you were in here last week, y'all did awesome. I mean, it was crazy. I thought, well, we'll have some distractions and stuff, but it was great last week. But listen, if there's some distractions today from the kids, it's okay. We're all family. You know, some, again, somebody's going to yell something out about Paw Patrol or something, or, you know, a kid's going to start singing a movie that they're watching. That's all good. We're just going to roll right through it. Okay. All right. So we're in our second week in our series called The Comeback, aptly entitled because we are coming back together. We came back into the building last week. And uh, last week we started with the thought in the series of coming back to the Lord, right? And the thought was revival, you know, and uh, we gave a definition of revival. Re we said that revival is a renewed interest in the Lord, A, and in the things of the Lord after a period of apathy. So apathy is just like, yeah, you know, whatever. I'm kind of indifferent. I'm not real fired up. I've lost some enthusiasm about Jesus, about his word, about prayer, about church. I'm just kind of living my life and I've drifted away from the Lord. Revival is when you go, hey, I've drifted. I'm coming back to the Lord. And we talked about that last week and we looked in Nehemiah 9 and we saw five evidences that you need a revival. And then we saw the steps to take to come back to the Lord. Remember? Y'all remember, what was that R word we talked about last week? Yeah, repent. That's the word. That, that's, a, that's a word that gets thrown around here a lot at Harvest Point. And if you go to a church, if you attend a church, watch a church, and the pastor doesn't talk much about repentance, you need to get out of there. Because repentance is a biblical concept and it's pushed all through the word. It's not comfortable for us to hear, uh, but if you wanna go to a comfortable church, head on down the road and go there. Here, we're gonna talk about what the Bible says, okay? So um, today, I, again, last week we started with come back to the Lord. That's the first place you're going to come back to uh, when you experience revival. It's a renewed interest in the Lord, but it's also this renewed interest in the things of the Lord. And so today we're going to pick up our thought, and uh, the title of the sermon is Come Back to Love. Now, uh, again, once you drift from the Lord, you know, I told you the story last week is I'm kind of walking my own way in my life. I do what I want to do. Nobody tells me what to do. I don't care about church. I don't care about Jesus. I don't care about the Bible. I'm just walking through life. And then something happens. For those of us that are Christians, this has happened. Oh, I do need God. I, I'm not as awesome as I thought I was. I do need a savior. I need a Lord because I can't run my life well. And what we do is we repent and turn and receive Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord. Now, what happens is, because we're just fallen human beings with a natural tendency to drift, and so at salvation, you kind of get fired up about the Lord, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm forgiven. Oh my gosh, I know the Creator. Like, I can talk to Him. He can talk to me. 
and you're like, man, I get to go to heaven when I leave this. Or, and like you get really fired up and you start telling people about your faith and you do this and that, X, Y, and Z. But then kind of as time passes, you just kind of get less and less enthusiastic about it. And then before you know it, life happens. Maybe you had a kid, maybe you got married, you got a new job, and, and, and your thoughts are less and less on the Lord and more and more kind of in this life. And so this morning, let's talk about coming back to love. Turn to Revelation chapter, actually go to 1 Corinthians 13 first. You can mark 1 Corinthians 13. I think it's safe to say um, our nation needs love now, right? Right? And it's sad because what you see is so much hatred in our nation right now. We need love. We need the people of God to come back to love and the priority of loving others. All right, you got the 1 Corinthians 13, put your ribbon or whatever you call that thing in your Bible and turn over to Revelation chapter 2. We'll go back and forth here, okay? We'll start in Revelation 2, we'll hop over to 1 Corinthians 13, and then we'll come back to Revelation 2. Now, in the context here, Jesus is writing a letter to a church in the city of Ephesus, okay? And uh, here's what he says in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1, he says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Now, listen, I'm just warning y'all. We're going geeky today, okay? Got a lot of Greek words. If you don't like it, sorry, not sorry. But, but so first Greek word here is uh, angelos. It's translated angel to the angel of the church in Ephesus. And the Greek word angelos means messenger. So more than likely, Jesus is speaking to the messenger at the church of Ephesus or the pastor. So y'all like to call me Kev or Pastor or Pastor Kevin, uh, angel's fine with me if y'all want to start <laughs> calling this biblical, right? So I guess we'll move on from that. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. So Jesus is identifying himself as the one who is holding these seven particular pastors and seven particular churches in his hand are my churches, my messengers. And Jesus identifies himself. He says, this is me speaking. Here we go, verse two. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how, how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd give us ears to hear. I pray that we would surrender our minds and our hearts and our ears to your word right now and that your word would come in and penetrate our souls, God, and that Holy Spirit, you would work supernaturally like you do to illuminate, to teach us, to challenge us, and then to change us, Lord. We want, we want you to be magnified in our life, Jesus. And so I pray that your word just change us in that. And uh, we pray it in your name. Amen. All right, so we got three things. We got the problem, we got, we'll look at the litmus test, and then we'll look at the plan of action. Okay, because that's kind of what happens when you figure out you got a problem. Now, I didn't think about this till just now, but I'm gonna, usually when you identify a problem, here's the order. You identify what's going on, and then you kind of sit and think about it like, yeah, how'd I, how'd I get there? And then you have a plan of action, right, to correct the problem. So my family's going to love this. They've been making fun of me now for at least two weeks. So... Um, I'm sitting at my desk back here a couple weeks ago and I'm like, man, my, my back just hurts, you know? I'm like, my back hurt. I need to do something about my back. And then I'm like, man, my, my posture's terrible. And so I get on Amazon. So I identified the problem, right? And then I thought, how'd I get here? 
like, how's my back? Like, what's going? And I'm like, well, it's probably because I slouch all the time and I sit. I'm just not, you know, I just don't stand. And I was like, I'm ordering a posture corrector. And so Kayla calls it my sports bra. She's like, why you got that sports bra on? So it just wraps around your shoulders and you tighten this thing and boy, it just straightens you up. And I had it on earlier. I was going to wear it out here. And Eric's like, dude, your arms are just going to go numb and you're not going to be able to pick up the Bible. And so I, I took it off. I took it off. Um, but that is just a silly illustration to show how we will identify a problem, think about it, and then uh, move to action in order to correct the problem. That's where we're going today, okay? We're going to identify the problem, we're going to consider some things, then we're going to look at the plan of action. Here's the problem, write this down in your sermon notes. You can become unloving over time, right? That's what Jesus said. I hold this against you in verse four. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Now, when we talk about love, we know around here we always say that love is a sacrificial action in order to benefit another person, okay? Love is by nature sacrificial, all right? It's gonna cost you to love somebody. It's gonna cost you time. It's gonna cost you effort. It's gonna cost you a bit of awkwardness sometimes. It might cost you some money, but love costs, okay? You have to give something in order to love someone. Remember, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving, right? God so loved the world that he did what? He gave, he gave his only son. And so love is sacrificial in nature and it's an action. You know, I feel like I say that a lot around here, but I think that we forget that at times, that love is not a feeling. We tend to think that love is that ooey gooey, warm feeling in our chest. That's not love. That's infatuation. Love is an action. You say, well, can you, can you prove that, Kev? I mean, if you just look at what we read, Jesus said, you've forsaken the love you had at first. So what was his prescription in verse five? Repent and do, do, repent and do what you did at first. If love was a feeling, it seems like Jesus would have said, repent and feel the way you felt at first, right? But love's not a feeling, love's an action. It's a sacrificial action, and listen, it's done in order to benefit another person. It's whatever they need for their benefit at the moment. That's what love does. If it's a word of encouragement, love encourages. Sometimes love's got to call you out on something, right? Think about it with your kids. Sometimes love gives your kids a big hug, but sometimes... Love spanks your kids, right? Because it's not a feeling, it's an action. It's for the benefit of another and it's sacrificial. Love is others focused, okay? It's not me focused. It's not that I'm the center of the world. Love is about other people, okay? Now, did you know that love's not a small topic in the Bible? That's not something that's just kind of glanced over one or two times throughout the whole Bible. That's not the case. Did you know that Jesus was speaking to a group of religious people and one of them had a question for him in Matthew chapter 22, uh, starting in verse 36. Uh, one of these really religious people said, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Look what Jesus says. He replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your uh, strength, we know from another account. And then he says in verse 38, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second greatest commandment is kind of just like it, Jesus says. Here's number two, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus, what's the greatest commandment, love? Love. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments, to love the Lord your God and love others, right? If you want to sum up the law, like what's God's standard? What's God's standard that the Bible teaches? You can just sum it all up with this, love. Love God, love others. Did you know that love's an identity marker? For Christians, you know what Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35? He said, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. What, Jesus? If I got a fish on the back of my car, everybody will know I'm a Christian. Right? If I listen to Caleb, everybody will know I'm a Christian. 
If I wear a Christian t-shirt, everybody will know I'm a Christian. O for three right there. Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Love is the number one virtue of the Christian life. Okay, we can't miss that. We can't miss that. Now, you don't have to turn there yet. I've just got a cross-reference for you. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, Paul says this. Now, these three remain faith, hope, and love. What's the greatest of them? Love, right? Love is no small topic or subject in the Bible. Love sums up uh, the law of God. Love marks and identifies us as Christians. And love is the number one virtue in the Christian life. And Jesus said to these Christians in the city of Ephesus 2,000 years ago, he said, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. The word forsaken is the Greek word of me, and it means to send away from or to leave. It's actually translated 38 times in the New Testament. It's translated left. You've left. Uh, we see that in Matthew Chapter 4, verse 20, it's the same Greek word uh, when it says, at once they left their aphiomi, they left their nets and, fo and followed Jesus. Jesus is saying here, man, some of you guys have literally forsaken or left the love you had at first. You say, what's he talking about the love they had at first? At first What? Well, see, this is what happens. You know, I gave you a little walking illustration a minute ago. At the point when you go, I need God. I need to be saved. And you turn, you repent, and you turn to Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Something happens. You are justified by God. You are saved. You are forgiven by God. But then you get the Holy Spirit in your life. And you know what happens? Romans 5.5 5 tells us that the love of God is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And so at salvation, you get the Holy Spirit, and then God's love is poured into your heart. And that's what happens. At first, man, you get saved, and you're this new creation. You're just a new person, and the one thing that marks you is love. You just start loving people differently than you used to. And it's so natural. Like, I remember this guy that, um, was coming to church years and years ago and um, he was kind of seeking and looking. Well, come to find out, this guy gets saved, right? Next thing you know, this guy's doing stuff that is not natural to his character at all, okay? This guy's coming up to me after church going, hey, you know this single lady in our congregation, she's in her 50s. I was just outside and I was noticing, man, her tires are pretty bald. Here, here's 200 bucks. We got to get her some tires. And it's like, who are you? You know, I mean, that's the radical change that Jesus brings into your life when you become a Christian. And it's characterized right at first. When you first get saved, you are characterized by love. You're so happy that you've been set free from your sin and you feel like chains have loosed and you just want to share it with other people. You just want to love on other people. And that's the love Jesus is talking about. It, it's that initial love for others that we can eventually kind of drift away from. And again, we don't mean to. It's not because you're just a bad person that you've drifted away from that initial love for people. It's just that life gets in the way. And you got ball practice. You got sickness and you got to mow the grass and you got kid issues and you got to figure out how we're going to school them. We got, and, and life happens and we just kind of drift from being others focused to kind of turning it in on ourselves, right? Jot this down. You can do lots of good things, but neglect the best thing. Because if you look there in Revelation 2, when Jesus says in verse 2, I know your deeds. You know, never forget that. Jesus knows what you're doing. Jesus knows what we as a church are doing. He knows what you're doing individually. He says, I know your hard work. I know that you serve. I know that you serve outside of the church. I know you serve inside the church. And listen to me, the basis or the motivation for serving should be love. But there's this weird thing about us. We're so rotten to the core 
that we can actually serve but do it in a way where we're not loving people. And when we don't love people through our service, when we're not serving based on love, we're missing the whole point. And so what can happen is you start to do things as a duty or an obligation or it's just a job and then you leave the love piece out of the equation altogether and you just do your duty and you call it service. Think about it, you can serve at church and not love people. Did you know that? So um, we have Harvest Kids. Now obviously uh, Harvest Kids is not meeting uh, yet, but uh, we'll be back to that hopefully in uh, six or eight weeks if, if need be. Uh, but what happens is, is we have, what, how many volunteers? We had 30 something volunteers back there in Harvest Kids. And uh, if you don't watch it, you can drift into serving but not loving people because you, you can sign up and go, well, you know, I partnered with Harvest Point. And in the partnership class, Kev explained to me that God expects for me to serve. Therefore, the church expects for me to serve. So I do need to serve. And you can kind of feel a little like, yeah, I should probably serve. I need to serve somewhere. Uh, they need help in the kids. And you can sign up to serve in Harvest Kids and then you know what happens before long? You get on the monthly rotation and about three or four months in, you can wake up on your Sunday morning to come serve in Harvest Kids and go, eh, I got the kids today. Y'all laugh because you know it's true. <laughs> you know? And you go, oh, I'd rather be in service today. I got to wrangle these little monsters around. You know, and you're like, and it's, and it's this, it's, well, I got to do it because I said I'd do it. I got to do it because I said I'd do it. I'm on the schedule. You know, I told Reuben I'd be there. I'll be there. So I'm going to go do it. I don't want to do it, but I'll go do it. But listen, listen, how much different is that attitude than somebody who gets up on that Sunday morning and goes, you know what? I get to sacrificially pour Jesus into kids today. I get to go back there and I get to build fun-loving relationships with these kids and pour Jesus into them on their level. And, and man, I don't know what that's going to produce, but maybe five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, they profess Christ. Maybe some of them grow up to be pastors or missionaries or Sunday school teachers. I don't know what the Lord's going to do with them, but I'm fired up that I get to go pour into them. See, that's love. That's serving and loving. The other piece is just doing my job. I'll just show up and watch the kids and thank God I don't have to do it for another month. See, you can serve without loving. You can, you can get on any team in this church and serve without loving people. You can be on the security team and instead of going, you know, I'm sacrificing one week of being in service but God, I'm just going to pray that, that you keep our church safe. God, I pray that I just have to stand at the doorway today and there's no issue. But Lord, I want to sacrifice my Sunday in order to serve and love your people in order to protect them in case, God forbid, something happens. That's serving in love. Or you can go, oh, I got security today. I'm just going to have to stand in the back. Just stand there, watch my phone, listen to kids yelling in the kids' room. It's so boring. It's so lame. You, you see the difference in attitude? You can serve on the media team, and you can come here and set up everything, and you can run slides, and you can do the lot. You can do that, and it can just be a job to you. You can come here and paint walls. You can come here and fix door hand. You can come and serve at any capacity, but you can do it in a way that's unloving. And that's what they were doing in the church in Ephesus 2,000 years ago. Not only were they serving well, Jesus says, I know your hard works. I know your perseverance. Down in verse 3, he said, you've persevered and endured hardships for my name and not grown weary. We can do all that. We can persevere and endure hardships. Listen, our coworkers can make fun of us at work because we're not in the dirty joke group, okay? Uh, your family members can poke at you and prod at you and be skeptical towards your belief and mess with you. And, and you can take it like a champ. You can do all this but be unloving. He says, I know that you can't tolerate wicked people. Ooh, I know that you take sin seriously. 
I know that you confess sin individually. I know that you preach on it as a church. I know that you confront sin in yourself and in others in order to be holy. I know that you're set apart from the world. You're set apart from wickedness. You are holy, but you're not loving. I love this too. You've tested those that claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. Y'all call out the Joel Osteens and the prosperity gospel. Y'all call out the Creflo dollars and that word faith stuff that he goes by. Y'all call out false apostles and false teachers. Man, y'all got great theology. You got perfect doctrine. Man, I'm telling you what, you can study and learn, you can teach, you can know the word enough even to spot, spot a false teacher or a false apostle. But you ain't loving people. See, you can do all these things and not love people. All these good things that this church did in the city of Ephesus, was that they were great things, but they didn't really involve loving people. They knew a lot, they did a lot, but they didn't love people. Not like they did when they first received Christ. How about you? Did you start out great at salvation, but now you've kind of drifted from loving people? That's a problem for some of us. And here's a reminder from 1 Corinthians 13. You can go ahead and flip over there. Verses 1 through 3, if you're like, yeah, I think I might be struggling to love people, remember what Paul said. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but I don't have love, I only sound like Colby beating on that cymbal with nothing else, bing, ding, right? If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body over to hardship that I may boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. So we see how important love is. You say, okay, well, um, love, I hope I'm loving. I think I'm loving. All right, well, let me help you with that. Here's the litmus test, starting in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, verse 4. Let's describe how love acts. And then I've put in your sermon notes, if you've got them, uh, I've, I've got a question for every description. There's about 14 descriptions Paul gives us here, and I'll give you um, a, a description of that, and then you can take the test yourself. Am I patient? Yes, no, eh. I put eh in your sermon notes. That's like a no, but I don't want to admit it, just so you know. Okay, number one, love is patient, okay? Love is patient. Greek word makrothumia. That's a compound Greek word, okay? Makros means long in time or long in duration. Thumos means a passionate outburst of rage or of anger. And thumos comes from the root word thio. I love this Greek word. The Greek word thio means to get heated up and to breathe violently. You know, when you go, and I'm kind of mad, you know? And so what Paul's saying here is love is patient. Love, love is long-tempered before you and then blow up. Love is patient. It's long-tempered. It takes a while for you to get heated up, for you to boil over and for you to explode. Macrothumia or patient is the opposite of being quick-tempered. Are you patient? Do you have the ability to be wronged and then not blow up on somebody and not retaliate on them? Even if you haven't been wronged, do you have the ability to be patient? Are you patient? If you're not patient with people, you're not acting in love. Listen, I wanna give you all another silly example. If you guys know me, you know that when it comes to Kevin and technology, it's like I lived in the 1800s, right? I don't know anything about technology. So um, Sam Banker comes over here about a month ago to help. You want to come up here? 
Okay, I didn't think so. So, so Sam comes over here like a month, six weeks ago, and she wants to just help me uh, clear out my computer and get some space on it and do all these things. And she's over here for like six, eight hours. And I'm like, where's the inner button, you know? And she's like, Kev. But she, listen, she was so patient with me. And then let me tell you what I did. That very, not, not only did she, she clear off space on my laptop and my desktop, she cleared off space on my phone. She updated my phone. She did all this stuff, right? Let me tell you what the genius does. I go home that very night and plug my phone up to my laptop, and somehow my iPhone 8 turns into like an iPhone 2. And I've got pictures from like 2015 on. I'm like, so I call Sam. I'm like, I really messed up what you did. And you know what's funny? She didn't say one hateful word to me. If I were her, I would have said things I couldn't say right now, okay? She was so patient with me to the point where the very next day she came back over here for an amount of time and fixed what I messed up. That's so loving. That's so loving because love is patient. How you do with that? Or are you like, hey, honey, take the clothes out of the washer and put them in the dryer. Tick, 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 120 seconds. Pass by. Hey, have you changed the laundry over yet? Well, what, what's, what's, what's the problem? You got lead in your feet? Or, or if you're like that, you're not patient. You're not loving. Christians should be the most patient people in the world. We should be. So question, just look in your uh, sermon notes there. Am I patient? Yes, no, eh. Here's the second description. Not only is love patient, love is kind. Krestos, it means useful. It means to be useful or helpful to somebody when you don't have to be helpful to somebody, okay? It's your own free choice to go and be helpful to somebody, to be kind to people. Remember, it's about others. Love is others focused, okay? And love acts kindly to other people. I'm telling you what, when this coronavirus thing hit, I'm telling we have some of the kindest people here in this church, I promise you. We, we just had a family, we had a family that was like, hey Kev, you know, I know, I know your family's under some stress. Kayla works in the uh, healthcare industry, so there's added stress to that with all this coronavirus stuff going on. And she's like, I know things are haywire for you at church. Listen, we want to provide a couple meals a week for you and your family. It's like, um, you don't have to. In fact, I should probably be providing you meals. No, 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 Kev. We got you. Just a couple times a week, we just want to love on you. We want to be kind. Love is kind. That was so, so loving. And I mean, very practical ways you can be kind. When you're at Lowe's and the old man can't get what he's reaching on the top shelf and you just go over there and help him. That's just kind of, that's a practical way to be kind. So you should remember that when you're posting on Facebook this week, Okay. At Harvest Point Church, we ought to not have people posting stuff on Facebook where, well, if some person disagrees with one little inkling of some secondary issue, if they disagree with me, we can't be friends anymore. And I'm going to give them a piece of my mind, and I'm going to tell them how I feel, I'm going to tell them that I'm right, I'm going to tell them that they're wrong, and I'm just going to hammer them. That's not loving. That's not loving. You're adding to the hate when you do that. We should be kind. Am I kind? Yes, no? Eh. Love isn't envious. Jealousy is unloving. Jealousy is when you feel bitter because of what somebody else has. We ought to be happy for people when they advance. We ought to be happy for people when they're blessed by God. But what happens is we get kind of self-focused. And we're like, yeah, I didn't get that promotion. I, I didn't get that car. I don't have the money to buy a house like that. I, I, I. They got pregnant. I haven't been able to get pregnant. I just, oh, and, and that's, that's love, loveless. That, that, 
jealousy, when you see somebody with a new car, with a new toy, with a new boat, um, and, and you, you, man, what's sad is we're so corrupt, we can envy people to the point where we just don't even like them. And it's not that they've done anything personally to you. You just kind of start thinking and Satan gets to working. You got these thoughts in your head and your envy turns into hatred. Love is not envious. Love doesn't boast. Oh, question, am I envious? Yes, no, eh. Love doesn't boast or brag. You know the show off that needs too much attention? The show off that always wants to be put on a pedestal? You know, tells you how awesome they are? Do you put the spotlight on yourself? Do you always spotlight your achievements, your accomplishments, your possessions? You know, like the person who, um, well, let's do a church example. You know, like old school churches had the pews and you'd walk by the pew and on the end of the pew would have this little gold placard and it would be sure to tell you who donated money for that pew. And we always do it in some Christian way, right? It's like, it's not that I want honor. I want God to be honored, but it's my name on the placard, right? You want me to tell you something I've done before? To boast? Somebody be like, yeah, you know, I think uh, the Bible talks about, you know, God working all things for our good. And I'm like, yep, Romans 8, 28. You know, and I don't really say it like that. I'm like, yeah, it's like Romans 8, 28, because, you know, I'm smarter than you think, and I want to appear humble sometimes, right? Right? You know, just, it's, just a, it's just a little way to brag. It's a little way to boast. You know, people go, you know, my, address me as Dr. So-and-so because I have eight degrees from X, Y, and Z. And, you know, it's like, okay. How about the people on Facebook that, that try to appear humble? They give the little subtle boasting when they're like, recommendations for the best place to eat at the New York airport on our way to Italy. It's like, yeah, we know you're traveling the world. Good for you. I'm at work. Whenever you focus on you, whenever you exalt yourself, you're not acting in love because love doesn't boast. Love is others focused. Do I boast? Do I boast? Yes, no, eh. How about this one? Love isn't proud. So if boasting is the action of letting people know how awesome I am, being proud is the attitude behind that. The Greek word, I like this, means to puff up or inflate. You know, it's that kind of attitude, that, oh, I'm awesome attitude. It's pride. It's when you're absorbed in your own ego. Love isn't proud. Love is humble it practices humility do you remember men this week in philippians 2 we talked about humility philippians 2 verses 3 and 4 where paul said you know do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit rather in humility value others above yourselves not looking to your own interest but each of you to the interests of others humility and pride are total opposites and love is not proud Are you proud? Yes, no, eh. Next, love isn't dishonoring. Love doesn't bring shame or a lack of respect. Okay, love's not insulting to people. You know, it's not belittling your coworker because they didn't get the job done uh, in time restrictions, okay? Uh, It's dishonoring when you lash out at your spouse. It's disrespectful, okay? How's that? Am I disrespectful? Yes, no, eh. Love isn't self-seeking. You're self-seeking when you do or manipulate things that help you or that further your cause or meet your agenda. That's self-seeking. It's, it's when you're always thinking about how you can benefit by using somebody else. It's, it's, it's using, it's manipulating, it's... It's just when you're always setting yourself up to benefit from something. You know, it's when you make friends with somebody because he's the manager at such and such store and you can get a discount from him. That's self-seeking. In a church scale, that's like us going to 
going out in the community and serving, not to honor God, but to show people who we are. We're Harvest Point. Maybe we'll get them to come to Harvest Point. That's self-seeking. It's to benefit ourselves. Some people become members or a partner at this church for what they can get. You know, partnering with Harvest Point and with any church for that matter is about partnering and giving to the Lord. But a lot of people think that you join a church so that you can get some kind of benefits. That's self-seeking. Love is not self-seeking. Love isn't easily provoked. To be provoked is to be uh, incited emotionally, to be stirred up to frustration. This kind of goes with patient. It kind of goes with the patient piece here. It's not letting people get under your skin by pushing your buttons, right? Your, sp your spouse is probably great at that, right? You know, I've told y'all before, like, I may or may not get in trouble here, but we'll just go with it. You know, I've told y'all before that like one of Kayla's pet peeves is the way I eat. And I sit in bed and I, and I eat, you know, chips or cereal. And this is like 11 o'clock at night and we're watching TV. And it just, you know, it just sounds like a rhinoceros is eating. I mean, it just is. And, 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 you know, there's some things that she does that, you know, I don't think is so great. And sometimes when she does things that kind of get on my nerve, I will be quick to lash out at her, right? But, but love, love's not easily provoked. That's not loving when we do that. You know, your boss critiques your work and you want to lash back. Real, that's not loving. That's not loving. How are you doing with that? Am I easily provoked? Yes, no, eh. How about this one? Love keeps no records of wrongs. The Greek word means to properly compute. It's the idea of keeping tally. Love forgives, y'all, right? Peter said love covers a multitude of sin. Love covers, it forgives. When somebody wrongs you, and asks for forgiveness, the loving thing to do is wipe the slate clean, okay? Now, when you hold something against somebody, listen, that's not going anywhere good. All you're doing is building up resentment and bitterness within your spirit when you do that, okay? So, so spouses, this is a good word for us. Well, last time I asked you to change the laundry, it took you four days and the clothes were mildewed and we had to rewash the laundry. What's wrong with it? You're keeping tally marks. You hurt my feelings when you said this. It was just like when you said it a week ago and then I remember four months ago you said X and Y. Listen, love doesn't keep a record. Especially, especially when the one who has offended you has asked for forgiveness. Does Jesus do that with us? Jesus is like, well, really, Kevin? I forgave you two weeks ago for gossiping, and then once again last week, I'm over it. That's not the Lord. That's not God's heart, because God's loving. If we want to be more like Christ, less like us, more like Christ, him magnified, we need to be loving, and love keeps no records of wrongs. How are you doing with that? Yes, no, eh? Love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. Doesn't delight in evil. So uh, when you're pitted against your coworker and uh, you're both up for the same promotion and there's one spot and there's two of you all and uh, the boss gives the promotion to your coworker because that's his boy and they go out and drink some beers every Thursday night after work and he don't really wanna hear you talk much because you're a Christian and he doesn't really like your worldview. When he gives that promotion to your coworker and then something happens down the road and, and, and your coworker goes out to the parking garage at work and his car's been broken into, it's unloving to go, yes, <laughs> jerk, right? He got that promotion and I didn't. He deserves for his car to be broken into. That's delighting in evil. Love doesn't do that. Love rejoices with the truth. Love expresses its joy in a person living in truth. Do you delight in evil? Yes, no, maybe. Yes, no, eh. 
Four quick ones, love always protects. Love doesn't expose people to harm, love protects people. That means love protects people's reputation. So, so the next time uh, somebody walks up and decides they wanna gossip with you, love protects, okay? Love doesn't join right in with the gossip. Love goes, hold, hold, hold on, why are you telling me this? I don't wanna hear that, I'm not gonna believe that about that person. I'm protecting them. That's what love does. Love protects us spiritually. Maybe one of your closest friends has become a Christian and maybe God's delivered them uh, from drinking. Uh, love protects. Love doesn't go, hey, I know that the Lord's delivered you from drinking, but let's hit the bar Friday night and we'll just you know, eat some chips and dip and have a few drinks. No, love protects. Love protects. I mean, a simple advice. What about when people take a loan out, you know, uh, no interest for three years? Love protects. Love goes, hey, make sure you're paying that and you get that paid off in those three years. If not, the interest is going to pile up and you're going to be, it's just looking out for people. Love says, hey, you don't need to date that guy. He's not a Christian. He doesn't have your best interest at heart. I'm trying to protect you and your heart. That's what love does. It protects, it always trusts. It always believes the best about somebody. It's not skeptical. Spouses, love always trusts. You say, well, what if my husband's done something to break my trust? Well, you forgive them and then, and then as they show you that growth, then you trust them. Relationships don't work without trust, y'all. Love, trust, it always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes. It always expects and desires positive things and positive outcomes for people. Always hope for the best. Boy, we need hope in our world right now, right? Right? Love hopes. Love says, man, we're in a bad spot right now as a nation, but I'm telling you, I believe that the Lord's gonna do something great in our nation. I'm hoping that he's raising up people. He's raising up Christians. He's gonna uh, sweep through in a great revival. Love always hopes. If you're wanting somebody to fail, if you're hoping they fail, that's not loving. Here's the last thing, love always perseveres. Hupomene is the Greek word. It's another compound Greek word. Hupo means under, to be under. Meno means to stay or remain. And so hupomeno means to remain under the load or to stay under the load. And we translate that as perseverance. It's continuing on course even in the face of difficulty. That's perseverance. Something's hard, but I'm gonna keep going. That's perseverance and that's loving. Listen, love doesn't give up on people. If your loved one struggles with some kind of addiction, uh, if, if your spouse is struggling, if they've stepped out on you, listen, if your kids, if you're like, man, my kid's 25 now, he's still not a Christian. My kid's 40 now and he's still not. Listen, love doesn't give up on people. Love perseveres. Love doesn't give up on marriages. Marriages get hard. It's easy to walk out. Love perseveres. And by the way, when you got married, you promised to love that one through the ups and downs, right? Good times and bad, sickness and health, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you've promised to love them and love perseveres. Love doesn't give up. Sometimes relationships in general, not just marriage relationships or dating relationships, just me and you, man, personal relationships get hard, don't they? You know why relationships get hard? Because we're going to get this inscribed in this church building somewhere. In the great words of Tony Maples, people are people. <laughs> that's going up somewhere in this church. People are people. Okay, and that's why relationships get hard. Because we're all flawed. We're all sinful. And we all struggle uh, to be open and honest. We struggle to love one another at times. But we got to keep going. We have to persevere with one another because that's what love does. Okay? Now, here's what I want you to do in your sermon notes. I want you to look at it. And I want you to look where your circles are. You got 14 descriptions of love. If all your circles are on eh, you need to come back to love. 
If all your circles are on no, maybe you need to be saved today. If all your circles are on yes, you need to repent because you're lying. <laughs> right? Right? So how did you tally up there in your test? Do you need to come back to love? We'll end with this. Here's the plan of action straight back from Revelation 2 verse 5. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Here's the prescription. Consider how far you have fallen. That's the first thing to write in your sermon notes. Consider. That's what we've spent about 20 minutes doing here. Considering. Am I patient? Am I kind? Do I boast? We've been considering. So before you get back on the love train, you're going to have to consider how far off the love train I've been. Here's the second thing Jesus says to do. Consider how far you've fallen and then repent. Write that down as number two. Repent. Repent means a change of mind that results in a change of action. Remember? So we consider, yeah, I've not been, I've not been very loving in the last month, the last six months, in the last year. I've considered, repentance goes, I'm changing my mind toward that, man. I'm going to be loving. That's repentance. Here's the third thing from Galatians 5.18. You can just write in your sermon notes. Be filled with the Spirit. In Galatians 5.18, Paul says, walk in the Spirit. Actually, I, I, I'm ahead. I'm ahead, Titan. Hold up. Ephesians 5. Be filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. Don't be controlled. You know how alcohol controls you when you take in too much of it? Instead of being controlled by a foreign substance, Paul says, be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Be filled, permeated with the Holy Spirit. Consider, repent, be filled with the Spirit. Here's the fourth thing, walk in the Spirit. That's Galatians 5.16 where Paul says, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. Now listen, being filled with the Spirit is when you say, Lord, I surrender I've been doing things my own way. It's not that I've lost my salvation, but just as a Christian, I kind of just been doing things my own way. I just surrender right now, and I ask you to forgive me of my sin, and please fill me with your Holy Spirit. That's being filled with the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is when you take uh, uh, the back seat to the Holy Spirit in your life, and you obey moment by moment. Remember, walking in the Spirit's a moment-by-moment -moment thing. You can be walking in the Spirit one minute and then not in the next. To be filled with the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. And this is key, guys. This is key. Because I've not done a good job communicating with you today if you guys walk out of this church this morning and say, I need to try to be more loving. If that's on your brain right now, you, we're missing it, okay? Okay. I'm not up here saying you need to try to be more loving. You know why? Because you can't be. We're sinful, man. We're bent to, to focus on ourselves. The only way you can love how Jesus is prescribing us to love is when you are filled with the Spirit and are walking in the Spirit. It's not trying really hard to be like Jesus. That's not the Christian. The Christian life is surrender I surrender, take up my cross, fill me with your spirit. I want to walk in the spirit in obedience moment by moment. That's the Christian life. We got to get that, man. We have to because so many of us think that the Christian life is just trying really hard to be like Jesus while he watches us and claps for us. That's not it. It's not it. And, and you know that through experience. You know that when you try really hard, you always just kind of fall. Because it's not in your power, it's in the power of the Spirit. That's why Paul says, walk in the Spirit, and when you do, the fruits of the Spirit will show up. You know what the fruit of the Spirit is? What's the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. Love, joy, peace, kindness. Love is kind. Patience, good. Love is patient. Look, we got kids here, that's awesome. Kind of looks like the fruits of the Spirit and the description of love kind of go hand in hand, right? Right, because they do. And you're only going to love that way when you're walking in the Spirit. So consider, repent, be filled with the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, and then fifthly, back from Revelation 2, love like you did when you first got saved. That's what Jesus says. Consider, repent, and then do the things you did at first. 
But again, you're only going to do that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you're walking in the Spirit. You will not do that by trying hard. All right? So the problem is we've drifted from love. Uh, The litmus test of love, we gave it, 14 descriptions. Now the action plan is to consider, repent, be filled with the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, and then love like you did at first. That's what we should be walking out of here with today is I need to be filled with the Spirit. I don't have the power to live the Christian life. I need the Holy Spirit to live it through me so that I can love like I should love. Here's your sum up. We have a natural tendency to get busy with life and turn from the love we initially displayed when we first trusted in Christ. Are you loving others like you used to? If not, come back to love. Okay? Listen, in a, in a crowd this size, there's for sure people here who have never experienced the love of Jesus. You've never surrendered your life that initial time. You've never been saved. You're still walking life your own way thinking you got it figured out. You're just here today because somebody asked you to come. But I'm telling you, you're going to end up in the ditch and you need forgiveness. Forgiveness comes when you repent, when you turn from your old way of life and change your mind and then you embrace Christ, you receive Christ as your Savior and Lord when you surrender to him. He died for your sin, he rose again. Will you believe that? Some of you need that today. Christians, we need to hear this message that, look, the world needs love, okay? The the world doesn't need your Facebook opinion. It needs love, okay? Love, we need to be loving one another, Okay, let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Jesus, thank you for challenging us here in Revelation 2. And God, we have taken some time, I hope, in honest reflection to see where we're falling short of loving people. And Lord, we want to confess that. And God, we just ask you to grant us repentance, a change of mind, Lord. And God, we just ask that you'd fill us all here with your Holy Spirit. We can't live the Christian life in our own strength. Lord, we get so tired when we try to. It is so exhausting to try to live the Christian life in my strength. Forgive me of that, Lord. Help me trust in you more in a way where uh, I can understand and know and then practice being filled with your Holy Spirit, Lord. So fill us now. Give us a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Help us walk in the Spirit, Lord, just moment by moment obedience to what you're leading us and nudging us to do. And as you bring Bible verses to our head and Scripture, that's the Holy Spirit in us, Lord. Help us walk in accordance with the Holy Spirit. And God, help us love like we did when we first got saved. We've drifted from that. Pull us back, Lord. Wake us up, Jesus. Help us love. God, we want to do it for your glory, not ours. So we ask you to help us, and we ask you that in Jesus' name. Amen.